Hey everyone, today we're going to learn about classical cadence types. So first, we'll talk about what a cadence is, and then the names of some different types of cadences, followed by a discussion of the treatment of the dominant chord, and lastly, uh, we'll get some practice writing some specific cadence types in different keys. So first, what is a cadence? Um, speaking generally, a cadence is just a stopping point in music. Um, so this can have many components. It can be melodic, where a melody rises up to tonic or falls back down to tonic to give a sense of closure. It can be a rhythmic cadence, where rhythmic entries start coming faster or coming slower toward the end of a phrase. Or it can be a harmonic cadence, that is, a pattern of harmonies that tells you that something is coming to a close. And that's really what we're going to focus on for today's lesson, and that is harmonic cadences in classical music. So first we'll go over the different names of the types of cadences. Before we do that I'm going to switch on over to Finale so you can see my screen. Okay, so we're looking here at a number of different cadence types and you can see all the, the labels for the types of cadences up here in the first two systems. We've got the perfect authentic cadence, PAC, followed by these other five, and we'll go through each one. I'm gonna write each one in the key of C major, or in this case C minor, just or A minor, just for uh, simplicity. Um, and then we'll get to the later keys in a little bit. So first, the perfect authentic cadence. This is, again, these are all different harmonic formulas, so they have to do with Roman numerals. And for the perfect authentic cadence, it's a type of authentic cadence, just like the imperfect is. The term authentic cadence means a dominant harmony closing to a tonic harmony. So the typical way we see that is a five chord moving to a one chord. This is the strongest type of closure we have in classical music in our harmonic formulas and it gives a real sense of a phrase or a section of music ending. So for a cadence to be authentic, it has to be a dominant harmony moving to a tonic harmony for closure. For it to be a perfect authentic cadence, it has to have a couple of other specific characteristics. One, that dominant, dominant harmony has to indeed be the five chord. So here's a five chord in the key of C major. And then that five chord has to move into a one chord. So something like this. You'll notice that I'm not using different stem directions for the tenor and bass, for example. That's just to save time. If you want to get really fancy in finale, you can play with the layers down here to make that happen. Um, but So you can see here I've written a five chord going to a one chord. What makes it perfect is it's not just a five going to a one, but both chords are in root position. If I put my Roman numerals in here, you can see that plainly, a root position five going to a root position one. So the bass is singing the root of each chord, they're both in root position, it's five going to one, and importantly, the melody goes T up to Do. Let's hear how that sounds. Out of context, maybe not the strongest motion you could ever hear, but uh, still, this is this is uh, the perfect authentic cadence. It is uh, the strongest type of closure we have in tonal music. The imperfect authentic cadence is any type of authentic cadence, dominant harmony moving to tonic harmony, that does not meet all of those requirements. Root position five, root position one, leading tone resolving to tonic. Um, and so here's an example of an imperfect authentic cadence. We could take that same five chord that we started with earlier. And instead of resolving it to a one chord in root position, we could resolve it, in this case, to a one six. Let's throw our Roman numerals on there. From five to one six just a little bit less sounding final because the bass isn't in its strongest position. Let's hear both of those back to back. Imperfect. 
the weakness of that base being on the third scale degree for an inverted chord sort of implies that there's more to come in this phrase. So that's our imperfect authentic cadence. You could make another type of imperfect authentic cadence that has root position five going to root position one, but that does not feature the melody going to Do, for example. So if we had something like this, if we had a phrase like this, we have the five chord respelled here. Both chords are in root position, but you notice that the melody does not end up on Do, either T Do or Re Do, and therefore it's not the strongest type of pull we could have. This is another example of an imperfect authentic cadence. Here, not because of inverted five or one, but because the melody didn't end up on Do. Remember, if any of those features are missing, your authentic cadence is imperfect, which is just a little bit weaker of a type of closure. All right, we spent a lot of time on PAC and IAC. Next is HC, that is the half cadence. Half cadence is really any harmonic formula that ends in five. Um, the authentic cadence category you can kind of think of as an answer. Well, then the half cadence is the question to that answer. It's the lead up, the setup to that. It sounds very, we could say, incomplete. Uh, we just had the imperfect authentic cadence, but uh, the half cadence sounds like it needs to go on afterwards. And so here in C major, we could precede the five chord with any of a number of different chords. Um, just for simplicity, we can start with the four chord. So there's our four. And moving from four into five, we remember our good part writing rules. Instead of moving everyone up in parallel with the bass, when the bass moves up by step, everyone else should go down to the nearest chord tone. So something like that, throw on our Roman numerals of four going to five. For this to be a half cadence, it doesn't have to start on a four. It could start on a one or a one six or a four six. There's lots of different options here. Just anything that can end a phrase on the five chord. So let's listen to that. Now you're waiting for that one chord to happen, but it doesn't at the end of the phrase which sort of implies that there's more music to come. On, to come. Uh, that is the half cadence, any formula that ends in a five chord. There's one particular version of the half cadence that scholars have given some a name, specific name to, and that is the Phrygian half cadence. Uh, here we're going to look at it in the key of A minor. It's called the Phrygian half cadence um, because of the distinctive half step motion that happens in the bass. So I already told you that any half cadence ends in a five. If we're working in A minor here, A would be the one, and the five would be E. So let's first uh, spell our, well, our, our five chord's gonna be here. We're gonna precede that in the Phrygian half cadence with a very specific chord, and that is the minor four in first inversion, the minor four six. So how do we spell that in A minor? lay in the bass. Um, there we go. <clears throat> Trying to spell a D, F, A chord here. So that's our minor four, six, and it's gonna go to a five chord. It's a minor key, so we have to remember to raise that leading tone. Okay. And I'm actually gonna go back and double this D in the upper two voices so that I can go down to B in the alto. All right. So this is an example of a Phrygian half cadence. It's the minor four in first inversion going to the raised leading tone five chord. Again, this is an A minor. Let's listen to this one. We hear that leading tone wanting to lead us back up to tonic, but we haven't gotten there yet. Again, a very specific type of the half cadence. It won't come up that often, but it's got a name, so we'll talk about it. 
All right, two more cadences, the deceptive and the plagal. The deceptive cadence is similar to the authentic cadence in that it features a dominant harmony moving into a tonic, but it's a very specific tonic and that is sort of a trick answer kind of tonic. That is when the five chord goes somewhere surprising that's not the one. Uh, in, this, in the classic sense, this is the five chord going to the six chord, which is why we sometimes call that the, do, uh, the, the tonic substitute chord. So here's our five chord, and instead of resolving to one like we did up here in the PAC, for the deceptive cadence, we're going to resolve sol up to la. The leading tone still usually resolves up, especially in an outer voice, to the place it wants to. We get this kind of funny doubling on the six chord where there's two C naturals. And I'll throw our Roman numerals in here. The five chord tricks us and goes to the six chord instead. I see I didn't make a six chord, so let's make a six chord. There we go, five to six. So I'll play the two authentic cadences and then the deceptive cadence. I'll play the PAC and then the deceptive so you can hear the difference. Sounds like closure as opposed to... It sort of sidesteps into the tonic area which is the substitute tonic of the sixth chord. A lot of the voice leading is the same. You see that the T do in the soprano still happens. Um, and sol in this case goes up to la instead. So that's the deceptive cadence, usually five going to six, although some expand that definition to being a five chord going to any other chord. All right, lastly, the plagal cadence. The plagal cadence is sort of a relaxing back into the one chord instead of progressing from five to one. What's the other way we can get there? That most versatile of diatonic chords, the four chord. So here we have the same four chord we used up there in the half cadence. But we're going to take that four and resolve it in a, in a way that sort of relaxes back into the one chord. Four, going back to one. Let's listen to that one. You hear how that one still ends on tonic. It ends in a very secure, stable place, but it doesn't get there by means of a leading tone or any other sort of tension. It just sort of relaxes back in. Here we use the subdominant category. Remember, that's the category of chord that's a departure type chord that doesn't sound like tonic, doesn't sound like home bass, but it does sound relatively free of dissonance most of the time. So it's a stable but not home bass kind of sound, relaxing back into the actual tonic. I'll play each of these one more time so you can get them in your ear, and then we'll move on to the second part of today's lecture. Here's the PAC. Strongest closure. Here's one version of the IAC, in this case the leading tone, or sorry, the, the tonic pitch does not end up in the soprano. Doesn't sound quite as fulfilling, or final. The half cadence, giving us a question at the end of a phrase. You can almost hear that tonic chord coming, but it doesn't happen yet, so we're ready for the next phrase. A specific version of that, this time we're shifting key to A minor, a very specific half-step motion in the bass from lay down to sol. Again, waiting for that tonic to come. Back in C major, here's the deceptive cadence where the five tricks you and goes to six. And usually some more music comes after that. And then lastly, the plagal cadence that relaxes from four back to one. That last one is sometimes called the church cadence or the amen cadence because of how frequently it's used in sacred choral works um, at the very end of a piece after the last dominant tetonic resolution. Then we get this four to one to kind of extend it. All right, so that's the names of all of our classical cadences. I want to talk about another aspect, which is treatment of the dominant. So you'll notice that in the chords that we've already seen, other than the plagal cadence, all of these cadences feature the five chord. This all-important chord defines the key or the tonic 
by giving us a leading tone, which is just a half step below tonic, giving us a strong, perfect fifth above the tonic in the bass, if it's a root position chord, sol to do. And in the case of the 5-7, which we haven't seen any 5-7s up here, we have an additional dissonant seventh above the root, um, where fa resolves down to me, the other half step in a major key. So for all these reasons, the five chord plays a central role in our sense of where we are harmonically, whether we're closing with a question in the half cadence or closing with uh, an answer in the authentic cadences. Uh, the five chord it plays a crucial role in that. Because of that, composers sometimes like to delay or fancy up that five chord. Uh, and this takes one of four approaches. That's this section here, the treatment of the dominant. So one is the simple cadence, where the five chord is just a five chord. But sometimes we see something more elaborate, a compound cadence that has a cadential 6-4 or a 4-3 suspension. We'll talk about those in a second. And then finally, the double cadence that combines all of those. So let's see how each of these would work. We're going to work, in this case, in C major, and we're going to do half cadences each time. So again, for a simple half cadence, I can just copy what I've got up here, um, where we can precede that five chord with pretty much any chord we want that precedes a five. There we go. I'm again going to use the four chord. So this is a simple cadence because the dominant harmony that's used just takes one chord to display itself. So we have the four, subdominant, the five, the dominant. There's just one chord here. It's just the five chord. If we wanted to make that simple cadence stretch out a little bit longer, we could use a compound cadence, namely the compound cadence with cadential 6-4. So here's that same cadence, but then I'll change it to make the cadential 6-4 interrupt the five chord. Now, instead of going right to this five chord, we can use a little different rhythm and delay that five. One second. There we go. So our Roman numerals now we're still going to that same five chord we were trying to go to, and the voice leading still works out the same. But you'll see that a couple of our voices, in this case the tenor and the alto, uh, have stubbornly went to different chord tones first before going to the five. So in this case, we're going to the one, six, four. You see in my Roman numerals, I've got a six followed by a four. Don't let that confuse you. It should say one and then a six with a four under it, but I didn't, wasn't able to make that look correct yet, so sorry about that. Um, so let's listen here to the simple cadence followed by the cadential 1-6-4. When I say cadential 6-4, I mean the 1-6-4, the tonic chord that's functioning like a dominant because it has the same bass note. Let's listen to these two. We're ready for the tonic. And then compound with cadential 6-4. You hear how that pair of chords kind of function because they have the same bass note, like an expanded or a compound version of the dominant? One more time. So we enter the dominant area here, but don't really get the root position five chord until here. A quick note on my use of the notation one, six, four. Um, you know, some, some music theorists, some scholars like to refer to this unit, the one, six, four, followed by five, all as a five chord. And so they'll label it actually just as a five, six, four, resolving to five, three. Um, so if your theory teacher teaches that way and wants you to answer that way, don't get confused. This is the same entity. It's a dominant chord that takes two beats to resolve. Um, but for our, for our purposes, we're going to call this the one, six, four, because these notes add up to a one chord in C major. 
All right, so that's one way you can delay the 5 is with a 164 where the 5 was supposed to be. Another way is by just delaying one of those voices to create what's called a 4-3 suspension. So here goes. Here's our 4 chord again. Now instead of going to the 164, we've gone to a 5 chord with a suspended 4th above the bass that then resolves to a 3rd. So this is a 4 chord. This is a 5 chord that really arrives here, but on the previous beat, where it was supposed to arrive, where we enter the dominant harmony, whatever note appears a 4th above the bass suspends from the previous chord and then resolves down by step, like good suspensions do. So I'll play these two back to back. They sound very similar. It's just a matter of whether that alto voice is getting in on the suspension action or not to make a 1-6-4 versus the 5-4-3. Very similar to that. So it's a pretty subtle change. Um, I'll play these two, the simple followed by the 4-3 suspension. It's really basically the same music, just one of those lines held into the chord change before resolving down, which gave that 5 chord a little more special quality to it, a little more drawn out, extended kind of nature. Um, another quick, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> another quick no no note on my notation here. Here I say 5, 4, 3. Please don't confuse that with the inversion symbol 4, 3. That is a a seventh chord in second inversion with the fifth and the bass. That's not what this is referring to at all. This is not a four three chord. This is a five chord, just a regular old five chord in root position with the third of the chord suspended briefly above the bass as the fourth followed by the third, right? Does that make sense? So we have the root, root, third, which is actually the fourth now, and fifth, so root, third, sorry, root fourth fifth becoming root third fifth. So I just wanted to clarify that. This is not a, an inversion symbol. Um, this is uh, a, a figuration showing a suspension. All right, so we've got simple treatments of the dominant. We've got compound treatments of the dominant where we have a cadential one, six, four going to five or another compound where the five chord just has a, sus a suspension four, three. The double cadence does all of those things put together. And it's a particular unique pattern that follows the same way every time it sounds like this, uh, or it looks like this. Okay, and if I put my Roman numerals on that, we start on a five chord, we end on a five chord. They're in the same position as each other. In between, we go back to the one, six, four, followed by the one, by the five chord with suspended four, that then resolves down to three. So we have the five chord, one, six, four, five suspended fourth, resolved down to the third. So it's kind of all one big five chord, one big dominant harmony um, that takes four unique beats or unique rhythmic entities to, uh, to display itself. So one more time, five, going up to one, six, four, to the five suspended fourth, resolve down to the third, just a regular five chord. And then we're ready for the tonic to come, presumably after that. So. I mentioned that each of these was actually uh, a different type of half cadence. They're all half cadences the way I've written them because they end on a five chord, right? Ends on a five, ends on a five, ends on a root position five chord, ends on a root position five. But they don't have to be that. Uh, I just chose a C major 
half cadence as my treatment of the dominant explanation. Um, but it is important to realize that these terms, simple cadences, compound cadences with cadential 164, compound cadences with a 543, and double cadences, simple, the two types of compound, and the double, these terms can be applied to any specific cadence other than the plagal cadence because it doesn't have a five chord. So, uh, so for example, you can have a simple perfect authentic cadence, a compound half cadence that uses the four three suspension, etc. And so for the third and final part of this lecture, we're going to talk through uh, practicing writing these specific cadences in different keys. Um, so let's let's dive into that right now. Um, so the instructions say we're in a major key, they give this key signature, and they ask us to write a simple PAC. PAC stands again for perfect authentic cadence. It is the type of dominant to tonic motion that is the most final, the most satisfactory complete. Uh, kind of motion we could get. So the simple PAC, so that's the, that's the PAC, but to call it simple, that means that the dominant part of the PAC, the first chord, has to just be a five chord and not delayed by some other thing. Great, that seems pretty easy. There's just two chords involved. What major key is this? A major, three sharps. So we're trying to get to A as our tonic, and we're trying to get there with an E chord, a dominant chord. So our simple PAC, in order to make this a perfect authentic cadence, I have to remember that the soprano has to end up on Do, and we could either get there from T up to Do or Re down to Do. Uh, let's try Re to Do this time. So someone else is going to have to take T. We'll give it to them, to the altos. And we need another root for a well-balanced five chord in root position. That leading tone usually wants to go up to tonic, um, we know someone needs to get to the third, so we'll take this. They're the only ones that are available to get to C-sharp, because the altos are too far away. Now the altos have the choice to either go down to E to get a complete chord, or to follow the leading tone where it wants to go voice leading-wise and go up to tonic. Really either is acceptable in this context, we'll take them down to E. Let's listen to our simple PAC in A major. That sounds pretty satisfactory. That sounds pretty convincing as a closure to our phrase. This time we took the melody from Re down to Do instead of T up to Do, but it still works. We have all the components of a PAC, a dominant harmony going to a tonic harmony with the bass going Sol Do in root position and the melody ending up stepwise to Do. That's all the components of a PAC and it's simple because the five chord is just a five chord and not elaborated with some other delay. Let's move on. Here we are in a major key with two flats. We're trying to write a compound half cadence with a 4-3 suspension. All right, let's unpack that. So we know that a half cadence is one that ends on a five chord. Um, but we know it ends on a five chord that is delayed a little bit. That's what makes it a compound half cadence. So let's think about this. To make this a half cadence, we're going to need to do something like, well, let's back up. You can't think about harmony or chords until the Roman numerals until you know what key you're in. We're in a major key with two flats. That is B flat major. So we're trying to get to B flat major's dominant chord for the half cadence. B flat is one, so what is five? B flat C, D, E flat, F is the five chord. So that's where we're trying to end. And we're going to get there with two unique entities, one with a suspended four and then a resolution. Before that, we need to write, if you're writing, if you're following along at home in pencil, write these over here. Uh, you're, you can't move your pencil strokes later. All right, so we need to precede those two with something else. Uh, name a chord that can go before a five. I've already used the four chord, so I'm going to try to avoid that. Uh, instead, maybe I'll use the 2-6 that has the same bass note. So, Fa, Sol, Sol. In order to get there, 
Uh, let me get my Roman numerals out. I think I need to create a 2-6 chord. Shouldn't be hard. There we go, 2-6, going to a 5 with a suspension 4, resolving down to the 3rd. So that's what I'm trying to spell here in B-flat major. How do I spell my... So, so it has all the harmonic components. It's a compound half cadence because it's any chord I wanted going to a 5 chord. Well, not any chord I want. Don't pick a 3. That doesn't go to 5, does it? Um, but in this case, a 2 chord going to 5, that makes sense. And we put the 2 in first inversion. So we have a half cadence because we end up on a 5 chord. It's a compound half cadence because the 5 has two different entities in the dominant harmony. Specifically, it's a 4-3 suspension because that 5 chord has a suspended 4th going to a 3rd. So here's the 2-6. In B-flat major, I want to write a 2-6. The second step of B-flat is C. So I know I need to spell this C, E-flat, G. I see that it's a first inversion chord, but that the bass is singing a fixed scale degree, Fa. So I'm going to use standard doubling, which is to double the bass. I'll go ahead and double the bass up here. I still need a C and a G somewhere in this chord, so I'll take the tenor on C and the sopranos on G. Now I'm trying to get in B flat major to an F major chord, but we're going to suspend that. Usually when I write these 4-3 suspensions, I like to just write this first chord going directly to the 5 chord in root position, and then just back up and see which one was supposed to be suspended um, beforehand. I see now that I've written myself into a corner, but we're, we're, I'll show you in a little bit the mistake that I made and we'll fix it. That's okay. You, that's why we're working with pencil, right? Um, so we're on a two chord. We're going to go to a five chord. We're going to skip this one. To get to that five chord, it looks like the smoothest voice leading is to keep the C here. We see that the E flat moves up to F, so we'd better move this one down if we can. Yeah, so there's a couple issues with this. Uh, the first one is that we ended up with two C naturals and no A, so we know we definitely need an A in this chord. Uh, and the second one, if we try to make this a 5, 4, 3, well, what's a fourth above F? Well, F, G, A, B flat. Well, I see that, that it's not literally a suspension, right? There's no B flat. We chose a chord here that didn't have a B flat in it because we used the 2, 6. There's no B flat in this chord, so there is no voice available to do this suspending. That's okay. We can step into that suspension. Um, it's not technically a suspension, but it's going to get the job done for, for our purposes. So here we have uh, an F, B flat, C, F chord. That is the root fourth, fifth, and root. And that fourth, like it's supposed to, will resolve down to the third. Um, if this chord that preceded the five with a fourth suspension had a B flat, that B flat should be the voice suspending into the B flat. But instead, we just moved by step. Okay, so that took a while to explain. Sorry about that. But let's take a listen. You're still left with this sense of wanting to go on. Uh, because we ended up on a dominant chord, the half cadence, the question, uh, but here goes. Mm, you're waiting for that B flat to come. Uh, okay, so there's our compound half cadence. It's compound because the dominant has two parts to it. It has a 4-3 suspension, technically not a suspension because that B flat wasn't preceded by another B flat, but for our cadence purposes, this will get the job done. If we really wanted to make this a true suspension, and this, this would be, I would count this as exactly correct. It, if we truly wanted to make this a suspension, we'd have to back up and select a chord here in B flat major that has a B flat in it, so that B flat could then truly suspend by not moving into this note before resolving down. All right, let's move on. Um, we've only got three left, and then the lesson is over. So compound DC, deceptive cadence, with a cadential 164. So this one's a little bit tricky. Um, let's remind ourselves what a deceptive cadence is. A deceptive cadence is one that takes 
uh, the five chord, resolving in a sneaky way up to the six instead of to the root position of one chord. It's sort of a surprise version of the authentic. So from that five going up to six is the deceptive motion. And we also want to make it a compound deceptive. Remember that compound refers to how we treat the dominant. The dominant is the first part of a deceptive cadence, five going to six. So that five is going to be delayed with a cadential 6-4. That's always the 1-6-4. So that gives us our entire um, harmonic formula, and that is we're going to go 1-6-4 to 5, and then that 5 will resolve up trickily to 6 instead. I see that I've asked for a minor key with one sharp. That is E minor. So let's think first what, uh, what a 1-6-4 in E minor looks like. Well, E minor, E, G, B is how you spell the one chord. And if we wanted to put that in 6-4, that would have the fifth in the bass. That is a B in the bass. So that's our bass note for the 1-6-4. That's also our bass note for the five chord. And then we're going to, in a sneaky way, resolve that up to six instead of resolving it up to the one. So our 1-6-4 like all good 6-4 chords, we'll have a doubled bass note, and the remaining two chord tones in the other two voices. Here's the 1-6-4. It's going to resolve to the actual 5 chord. I'm going to come back to this chord. I missed something about this chord. I'm going to come back to it after I play it for you, and you can tell me what's missing. Uh, hopefully your ears can. So here's 1, 6, 4, going to the 5 chord and resolving up to the 6. Well, we can't take the bass up to from sol to lay because that's parallel octaves with the bass. So instead we have to take that bass note, or that tenor note, down. This alto voice wants to go up to tonic, and the sopranos actually will go to tonic as well for something that looks like this. So I'll go ahead and put my Roman numerals on, give you a second to try to figure out what small thing I did wrong in this chord. I did it wrong on purpose. So there's the 164, here's the 5, and here's the somewhat surprising 6 chord. Note that that's a major 6 chord because we're in a minor key. I'll go ahead and play this and see if your ear can't detect the thing that's not actually accurate yet with it. Well, it doesn't exactly sound like a surprising version of the authentic cadence, does it? So the chord that we need to fix is this 5 chord. We're in E minor. We have to remember every time we're in a minor key, if there's a dominant harmony, you need to use the harmonic minor scale raised leading tone, in this case D sharp, which is pointing up to E, the tonic of the key. Now let's hear what the compound deceptive cadence with cadential 164 actually sounds like. Wow. That's a really nice moment where you have this extended out 5 chord that's delayed by the 164, and then it just doesn't quite resolve where it means to. The altos get to resolve T up to Do, but those basses really kind of trick us into the 6 chord. One more time. If I play that again, and then just isolate only the tonic in the upper voices, you'll hear your ear will fill in the rest of that one chord that you expected to hear. Here goes. Oh, surprising motion into the six instead. All right, so that's one way we can write our compound deceptive cadence with cadential 6-4 in E minor. Um, I will note there's several correct answers to each of these because I'm not specifying for you the starting point of each of your harmonies. And so uh, this 164 could have been spelled with this B up in the alto voice or with the B an octave up in the soprano voice. There's a, there's a couple of different correct answers, 
there's probably hundreds of wrong answers, uh, but there's probably, you know, maybe a half dozen or so correct answers that would all be uh, acceptable. Um, and that's the, the same thing for all of these. All right, we have two more examples. Here in a major key with two sharps, we're trying to write a simple IAC. IAC stands for Imperfect Authentic Cadence. An imperfect authentic cadence is an authentic cadence, dominant harmony going to tonic harmony, that, uh, that is missing one of its strongest components. It's either missing a root position motion from root position five sol to root position one do in the bass, or it's missing a soprano ending up on tonic by stepwise motion, t do or re do. Um, this time, let's hmm, let's see. We haven't written any five sevens yet, so let's go ahead and make that five a five seven chord and put this in inversion. So a simple IAC means the five chord will just have a single entity. Um, if we were to just spell a five chord in A major, A is the root, A, B, C sharp, D, E, there's E, there's the five, and it wants to go to one. Let's spell out the five chord first, and then we'll put it in an inversion. Sorry. I somehow got that we were in A major. We we're clearly in D major. It's been a long video. Let's keep going. So in D major, uh, D is the tonic, and so the dominant chord the, that we're looking for, the five, is actually A. We're not in the key of A. We're trying to spell an A chord. So it looks more like this. Um, let's see. So there's a, a five. Um, there's our five chord in D major. It's spelled A, C sharp, E. But let's go ahead and make it a five, seven, and give that seventh to the bass so that it becomes an inverted chord. Nice sound. Sounds like this. Da, you hear that bass wanting to go fa, me. So before we even write anything else, we've got to take that seventh of this five, seven. It's a five, four, two down to one six. Great. So we know that this is an authentic cadence because it's a five chord, but in particular, it's a five, four, two. This isn't an inversion symbol, five, four, two, which resolves usually to the one six because five goes to one, that makes it authentic. And actually both of these chords are inverted, which makes it an imperfect authentic. Whether the soprano goes to Do or not, we don't really care. It's already imperfect authentic because of the inversion. The bass isn't in its strongest position. So we know that that soprano will indeed go up to Do because it's on the leading tone T beforehand. How do these other remaining voices resolve? Well, we're trying to get to a 1-6, which is spelled D, F sharp, A. My intuition says that the tenor can just stay on A. We like small amounts of motion when possible. And then what would we most like to double? The altos don't really want to leap all the way up to A. Also, we don't want to double the A because it's the fifth of this chord. They could step up to F sharp, but that's not exactly a great uh, doubling, right? We don't need to double that F sharp in the bass. So instead, let's take them down to D. So we have two roots, a third in the bass, and a fifth. Here's a version of a simple IAC in D major. You notice we still get a sense of completion, of closure, but that closure is not as strong as it could have been if you listen to the bass note, that bass note, fa, mi, and mi wanting to then move on to some other place so it can finally end up on sol going to do. There's your simple IAC. Lastly, a compound PAC in a minor key. Yikes, there's a lot going on there. So we're trying to get a PAC, perfect authentic cadence. And a perfect authentic cadence, remember, it has to have uh, root position five going to a root position one. And it has to have do in the tonic pitch in the soprano at the end. So first, let's figure out what key we're in. We're asking for a minor key with two flats. 
Well, the major key, as we saw up here, is B-flat major, relative minor, the sixth step, or a minor third down from tonic is G minor. So we're trying to get to a G minor chord. I'm going to go ahead and just write temporarily in my G minor chord so that I remember to put tonic in the soprano. So I think that's the one chord we're going to try to get to at the end here. Something like that. And I know that we want to get there with either the leading tone T do or Re do in the soprano. I'm going to go ahead and write in my rests. And then one of these two notes will be the last note in the soprano. We're not sure which one yet. Remember, this is a dominant harmony, a five in root position going to one. In a minor key, what do we have to remember? We have to remember the harmony in a minor key uses harmonic minor. That is the raised leading tone, T up to Do. So one of these two notes will be the soprano note at the end. The bass note we know for sure will be Sol Do because it has to be a root position of five going to one. So we know that much. We're kind of working our way backwards here so that we can ensure that this is a PAC at the end. So we're looking for a PAC. That's not so hard. But what about a compound PAC? I guess let's back up, or let's finish this chord. We've got Sol, T, Re. We need one more note. We would really like to double the bass for this root position five chord. And if we just isolate these last two chords, we have a compound PAC. Now I don't love this alto F sharp going down to D for the final closure because it sort of frustrates that leading tone. So I'm actually going to take that one and move it up to Do with the soprano. Now we have three roots and a third and no fifth. A little stronger sense of final closure. All right, we have a PAC, that's done, but now we need a compound PAC. Remember that the compound cadence, uh, remember simple, the dominant harmony treatment is just a dominant chord. That's what we've got here, a simple PAC. A compound PAC, sorry, I'm realizing now I said compound, but what I really meant was a double. Uh, let me change this one. That's what I'm supposed to be asking you to do, so if you were a little confused up until this point, well that's why. I'm trying to write a double cadence here, and it's the double PAC. So to make this a double cadence, we need to use both versions of the compound. We need to start on the same five chord that we're going to end on at the end of the measure. Looks like that. And in the intervening beats, we're going to go to the one, six, four, followed by the five with four suspension, and then third resolved. So the Roman numerals will look like this, five, one, six, four in minor key, five with a four suspension, and then this one will become a five with resolved third. All right, yikes, how do we get there? Well, the note that doubles the bass, it's always important to double the bass note on a root position of five, and that really helps us out here because we know that those two notes are just gonna stay the same for this entire cadence. Whoever's doubling the bass will continue to double the bass. And then the one, six, four, we just move the other two voices up. The five, four, three, we move one of them back down. And then the five, five, three, that is the root position, it resolves back down. Notice that this F is actually sharp. It says so at the beginning of the measure. Here is our double PAC in G minor. If we wanted to, we could go back and just write this bass and tenor line as a pair of whole notes. Um, that would make, in finale, make it a little harder for me to label, but we could just keep those as whole notes and the upper voices would move um, accordingly. So those are all of our cadences. We have all the different cadence types we've already talked about, the perfect and imperfect authentic cadences. 
they give kind of closure, the half cadence, and it gives a questioning, begging kind of, begging, begging the question sort of uh, uh, sense of not real closure. The Phrygian half cadence, which we didn't do any part writing of because it's pretty rare, uh, which also has that kind of questioning ending. The deceptive cadence, which tricks us at the end, going from five to a tricky six chord. And lastly, the plagal cadence, which we didn't do any writing of, and that's the four chord relaxing back to one. We talked about the treatment of the dominant, that there's four different ways you can treat that dominant chord in any of these cadences. Treat it in a simple cadence, where the five is just a five, or the two versions of the compound, where you interrupt or delay the five with the one, six, four, or with a fourth suspension. And lastly, the double cadence, which features all of those put together, a five chord going to a one, six, four, going to a five with four suspension, resolving down to the five, five, three. And then we got a little practice doing part writing of all of those different cadences in various keys and talking about how the part writing works, how the voice leading works, and how to unpack these, uh, these terms so that you can write the cadences that are specified. One final challenge I will give to each of you students is to go find cadences, examples of each of these cadences in actual music. Uh, look at music from your applied lessons, music from your ensembles that you're in or that you've been in, from piano class, from any class that you're in or any uh, time that you're making music. If you have some old middle school choir music, pull that out and try to find these cadences. Try to recognize and label the cadence types by their harmonic formulas, uh, including whether they are simple, compound, or double. And try to do this not only with the score in front of you, but also with the audio. If you can play the piano well enough to work your way through these harmonies, that's great. If not, uh, get on a streaming service or get someplace where you can listen to the actual music with the score in front of you. I can't stress enough how important it is to be listening to real music in order to connect these theory topics to your actual listening practice so that you can recognize them when you're a choir director and you're coming up to a half cadence and that then informs you, oh, this is supposed to be a, a closure, but one that makes us feel like there's something else coming uh, after it because it's a half cadence. So dig through your music, uh, continue to do this, and try to identify different types of cadences, label them uh, by their harmony formulas and by whether they're simple, compound, or double. And that's the lesson. Thanks.